Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for our online shareholder Q&A session. Today we have our chair, Ken McKenzie, with us and I have questions from our shareholders across a range of topics, from uranium to executive pay. I'm going to put them to him while we have him here with us. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Gab, and, and hello to our shareholders. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the most important parts of my job is talking to investors in BHP, and the questions from our shareholders are important to us, and, and that's why we've set up this session today. I mean, I really enjoy these opportunities to speak with shareholders, and, and many have been shareholders for a number of years. And I know we've received a lot of great questions from direct shareholders ahead of the AGM in Perth later this month, and thought it would be valuable to hold an additional question and answer session to deal with them directly and, and to cover more of the topics that our, that our shareholders are interested in. Um, but maybe before we start and before we get into the Q&A, just a short summary of our report to shareholders. I think first and foremost, in summary, BHP is in a, is in a strong position. The, the 2022 financial year results, which were delivered in a challenging climate of uncertainty and change, really demonstrated that strength. I think most importantly, 2022 marked another fatality-free year. And for us, safety is the most important uh, job that we have. And we've had over three and a half years now without a fatality uh, and strong progress in other leading safety indicators. But we're not just focused on operational safety. Safety means workplaces that are free from sexual harassment, bullying, and racism. And we're determined to keep working to eliminate these harmful behaviors. We've made a lot of progress, but there's no doubt we've got a lot more work to do on that front as well. Financial year 22 was, I think, a, a transformative year for BHP. We unified our dual listed structure, and thank you, 97% uh, of our shareholders supported that across both the PLC and, and limited um, lines. We also merged our petroleum business with Woodside. We simplified our, our coal portfolio to concentrate on the higher quality metallurgical coal that's used for steel making. We approved an investment of 5.7 billion US dollars in our Janssen potash project in Canada, which is a new commodity uh, for BHP and, and opens up a potential new growth front. And we were able to deliver strong operational and, and financial performance. And shareholders would have seen that in the, in the record cash uh, dividends that we distributed uh, this year, 325 US cents per share, uh, plus an equivalent of a further 386 US cents per share in dividends through the uh, in specie distribution of, of Woodside share. So uh, a strong year in terms of returns to, to shareholders. Um, total economic contribution uh, for the year last year was 78 billion US dollars and that included 57 and a half billion US dollars in Australia and we paid close to 10 percent of all of Australian corporate tax. I think it was 18 billion Australian dollars that we paid in corporate tax last year. And in June we released our new social value framework, very proud of that, um, along with a scorecard that takes us out to 2030 and in that um, in that scorecard and, and in that framework we have six pillars decarbonization, the environment, indigenous partnerships, workforce, communities, and, and supply chains. And I think just touching on a, you know, a couple of the highlights uh, from that scorecard for financial year 22, uh, fresh water withdrawal was 29% below our 2017 baseline. And I know this is important to a number of our shareholders, operational greenhouse gas emissions in financial year 22 were down 24% from our 2020 baseline, and we're on track uh, for our 2030 emissions scope one and two target for at least a 30% uh, reduction in that time frame. In support of our, of our goal to pursue um, 
net zero value chain or, or scope three emissions. We've put in place five steel value chain decarbonization partnerships. Um, so those are partnerships alongside um, five of our important customers. Uh, and that's further supported by a commitment to invest more than $75 million in research and development. Uh, we now require all investment decisions to undertake a viability assessment under our 1.5 degree scenario as well. And, and then finally, we've defined and published our approach to just or equitable change and transitions that recognizes changes in our business can have significant and you know, sometimes disproportionate effects on communities where we operate. And people would be aware that we've announced uh, the closure of the Mount Arthur Coal operation by 2030. And so that policy uh, will very much be put to use um, w as we work our way through that, uh, work our way through that transition. So look, we're really pleased with our progress um, last year. We're positioning BHP for greater leverage to the mega trends. Decarbonization, rising standards of living around the world, and infrastructure for, for population growth. Um, we believe that you know, this repositioning that we've done over the, over the last you know, 12, 18 months has been so important, will help us continue to create value for you, you know, our partners and, and community stakeholders, and, and, and more consistently and, and reliably. So um, very excited about what lies ahead. Um, myself as chair, our board, our management team, um, uh, you know, very excited about the future. So thanks again for joining us today and, and looking forward to getting started with the Q&A session, Gab. Just listening to you, Ken, I do have questions uh, along the lines of, of what you were talking about from some of our shareholders. So um, I'm pleased to, to say that they've, they've, there's a lot of interest in, in what the company's been doing. Um, I might, if you're okay, skip to some of those questions sure. now. Um, the first actually that has come up is around um, our portfolio and growth. Um, and this is from a shareholder, uh, C. She asks, uh, will the company continue to focus on acquiring more copper assets? If yes, please elaborate more on how, where, and at what premiums. Right. Well, those are, those are really good questions, C. I mean, uh, obviously, we're very focused on our future-facing commodities. Those are the areas that we want to grow. Um, you know, Mike has Mike Henry, the CEO, has been very clear. You know, copper, nickel, potash are three of the commodities that we're that we're focused around. We're already really important uh, participants in the copper market. We have uh, the world's largest copper reserves currently, and so. When we look at growing copper going forward, there's a number of levers that, that we have. Obviously, the organic lever is important. We've already got this important reserve position. We've got our Escondida, Spence, Olympic Dam assets. And so getting more out of those assets is obviously an important lever for us to use, you know, using innovation and technology. We're also working with partners around the world um, around early stage entry. Uh, we're doing our own fundamental exploration work. Um, and yes, M&A is, is, is part of the equation, but um, you know, we're gonna be extremely disciplined uh, about that. And so it's not growth for growth's sake, it, it's, it's growth for returns for shareholders. So it's a pretty exciting uh, you know, phase that we're in uh, at BHP, where we're really looking you know, to the future, to future-facing commodities, and opportunities to create value for shareholders and, and growth. Um, C is loves potash. Um, uh, the, she also wants to know um, a, an update on on the Janssen project. Uh, and her questions are around: um, Is BHP's potash fertilizer asset expected to to begin production soon? Is the timeline until production um, delays due to licensing issues, or are there supply chain cons constraints, or is the project going according to plan. Um, and I might just read um, her comment. She said she became a shareholder once the announcement was released that BHP was going into potash. As I expect, this is a very good decision by the board. And, and further, she wants to know what is BHP's revenue and profit in this project expected to contribute to BHP's total income when this takes off? Right. Well, look again. All good. All good questions. Look, we're very excited as well about the entry into potash. Everything's going according 
to plan. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned in my introductory comments, we're, we're a little ahead of schedule. Um, so uh, we're looking at first ore in 2026. Previously, we were talking about 2027. Um, so we've been able to pull that forward uh, somewhat. And there's, you know, this is the first stage of multiple potential stages at Janssen. And so we're also looking at the opportunity, when does it make sense for us to look at stage two? Uh, of, of Janssen as well. So um, again, um, on track, uh, on plan, we haven't disclosed completely you know, what the look of the portfolio will be, but our expectation is that by 2030, future-facing commodities, so that's copper, nickel, and potash, should represent at least 50% of our portfolio. Um, thanks, Ken. I might move on to um, a question on uranium from Christian who asks, given the increasing demand for uranium, nuclear energy being the most reliable carbon-free energy, what are BHP uranium investments in Olympic Dam and elsewhere? And is BHP set to become a world leader in uranium extraction? Yeah, look, again, very good questions from our shareholders. Um, like, look, first, first and foremost, um, I think in general, in general you know, nuclear energy, uranium needs to be part of the conversation around how we decarbonize um, and how we work our way through the energy transition. So, you know, I would agree with, with um, the comments that were made there. It, it absolutely needs to be part of the, of the conversation. That said, for BHP, we're already a, a producer of uranium, but it, it's a byproduct of the production that we do at Olympic Dam. So, you know, the focus around Olympic Dam is copper, but we also get gold and silver and uranium as, as byproducts. And so for the, for the near future, uh, we'll continue to be a, a uranium um, producer. Um, but like all future facing, potential future facing commodities, uh, you know, we continue to review our position on an, on an ongoing basis. But, f but for now, it's, it's the byproduct that we produce at, at Olympic Dam. Thanks, Ken. Um, and I might move to another couple of commodities that shareholders have asked about. Um, Paul asks, what is BHP's attitude to lithium? Why does BHP not have any current lithium mines? Yeah, well, you know, lithium is a very hot commodity at, the, at, at, this, at this point in time. And as we all know, these you know, commodities are cyclical, are cyclical businesses. We've uh, taken a look at lithium um, in the past and, and, and we continue to look at it today. You know, there's a number of criteria you know, boxes that we need to tick at BHP for uh, a commodity to be, to be attractive for us. You know, first of all, it needs to be a commodity that can be meaningful in the scale and scope of, of BHP. Um, it needs to be, um, have steep, steep cost curves. Um, we like the rent or the profitability to be upstream in the supply chain and not in the middle stream or, or downstream. So there's a number of boxes that, that need to be ticked. In the case of lithium, it doesn't tick all those boxes for us. It's, it, the barriers to entry are quite low. It's quite abundant. Uh, the value is spread through the supply chain. So um, it's not necessarily a commodity that we're, that we're interested in pursuing at, at this point in time. But you know, we, again, we keep everything under continuous review. Um, and if I could ask about um, hydrogen in the same way, um, Ken, Natalia asks, is BHP looking to invest in hydrogen fuel in the next five to 10 years in Australia? Yeah, good question. Look, I think, again, hydrogen is going to be part of the energy mix um, going forward. I'm sure that as BHP, somewhere in our supply chain, we're going to be using, we're going to be using hydrogen, but, but more as a customer than a supplier. Um, we, we really want to stick to our knitting, and, and you know, we're a, a mineral resources miner. Um, and so we're going to focus on the future-facing commodities that I've, that I've talked about. Um, but we'll keep an eye on, we'll keep an eye on hydrogen, but, but more likely as a user than as a, as a producer. Right, thank you. Um, I, I have some questions here on our business structure. Um, and the first is from John. He asks, why doesn't the board consider spinning out BHP Iron Ore as a separate business as you did with South 32? Yeah. Look, we're, we're constantly looking at, at structural um, options for the company. You know, that was part of unification, for example. That was a, a structural option that we looked at. But in the case of our iron ore business, we have one of the best iron ore businesses in the world. We have the lowest cost 
uh, iron ore business in, in the world. High quality, um, you know, we look at the future of steel. Um, you know, one of the major thematics going forward is decarbonization. And, it, and if the world's going to achieve its goals around decarbonization, it's going to need a lot of infrastructure and, and, and a lot of steel in order to enable that infrastructure. So we think that, you know, decarbonization um, is going to happen. We think that, you know, that's going to be positive for steel demand and therefore, you know, two of our key commodities around iron ore and metallurgical coal that um, these are going to continue to be good places for our shareholders to be invested in going forward. Um, BHP used to own um, steel making facilities many years ago. I actually have a question here from um, a shareholder, uh, Natalia, who says, why don't we make steel in the Pilbara? Is, is that something that, um, that you think the board would consider? Yeah, it's similar to the to the question around um, you know hydrogen or um, you know nuclear power. Again, we need to sort of stick stick to our knitting. And, and I've talked about the things that we think make attractive commodities for BHP. Um, you know, good industry structures. You know, businesses of scale. Uh, you know, the rent being upstream in the process. Uh, steep cost curves. And those things that's, that fit naturally to our capability, which is mining. And so the further you move away from those things, the less, the less attractive they are for us. And so when we look at steel, there's a, again, there's a number of boxes that the steel industry you know, wouldn't, wouldn't tick for us to participate in. But again, we're, we're, you know, we're quite positive about the future of steel, but as a supplier to that industry as opposed to being a participant in making steel. Understood. Um, Ken, I might actually change tack now um, for, uh, for a couple of questions. We have a couple of questions around the cost of power and the supply of power. Um, the first is from uh, Craig. He asks, what is BHP doing to mitigate the economic risks for when blackouts and load shedding become commonplace in, in the Australian economy? Yeah, well look, we are you know, part of that 24% reduction in our scope one and scope two emissions is largely coming actually from scope two, which is our purchase of electric power. And so this is clearly part of the thinking as we transition into renewable energies, um, as we, you know, target our reduction in, in scope two emissions around security um, and reliability of, of supply. So that's, that's been factored in and, and you know, we're very confident that we've, we've addressed that issue um, and, and we'll continue to address that issue in the plans that we have. So energy security, reliability, not an issue for us going forward. Um, uh, 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 you mentioned nuclear power. Uh, this question from a shareholder is, um, is around that. They ask, will BHP consider building and operating a small modular nuclear power station? somewhere near Port Augusta to supply electricity to Olympic Dam and nearby mines and the industries of Port Pirie and Wyala. The Rolls-Royce reactor in such a small reactor will be identical to the small reactor in the UK nuclear submarine that may eventually be built in Adelaide. BHP has the capital, the brains and the long-term vision. I suspect this shareholder is from South Australia, Ken, but maybe if I could ask you to yeah. respond. Yeah, look, I, again, um very interesting uh, comments from the shareholder. Um, look, we believe, I said it earlier, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, nuclear power needs to be part of the conversation on how we decarbonize, um, you know, the energy sector in Australia going forward. Um, but for BHP, um, we're more likely to be a participant as a buyer of, of energy as opposed to a, a supplier of, of energy going forward. Thank you. Um, Ken, I might uh, change topics completely now. Uh, these are some questions around uh, executive remuneration, both at employee levels and at executive level. Um, Helen asks, when is BHP going to limit the remuneration package of the CEO and senior staff to no more than 10 times the wages of the lowest paid employee or contractor? Current remuneration rates do not represent good value for shareholders. Look, I, I understand the concern that shareholders have around executive remuneration, but, but the reality is leadership matters and talent matters. And, you know, when a, when a company is performing well, it's, it's, it's not an accident it's because it has good leadership. And, and, 
And the reverse is also true. That, you know, companies that lose their way often, you know, have lost their way from a leadership perspective. So, so leadership matters. And it's really important that, that we, as a board, are attracting the best possible leadership um, for our company. And it's a, very competitive, it's a very competitive market out there. So you know, we need to make sure that we're um, providing, you know, and, and we do a lot of work around this, Gab, uh, just continually benchmarking and understanding what's happening in the market. But we need to make sure that we've got a, a, a remuneration package which is both the quantum and the structure that will attract, retain, and motivate the best possible people. And that's in the best interests of our shareholders. Um, it, it, another question on pay, but on some specifics from Simon. Does the board and BHP leadership team think that linking annual bonuses to lagging indicators, for example, actual level four events, result in improved safety performance? Um, if so, could you explain this? When significant research over the past 10 to 15 years highlights that linking bonuses to lagging health and safety indicators is counterproductive? Great question and, and uh, comments are, are valid. Um, that's why we use both in our remuneration structure. So, and you need both. Um, leading indicators tell us where we're going, lagging indicators are the scorecard of how we've done. And so I, I think it's really important that you have both of those perspectives. In our scorecard, if you take a look at it, yes, we have um, AL4 uh, level, which is, a, which is a lag indicator. It's the check and balance, if you like, in the system that it's actually delivering. But we also use our uh, FEL, uh, which is very much a forward-looking uh, indicator uh, in there as well. So we're using both lead and lag indicators. You can't use one or the other. You need to, you know, our view is you need to use and uh, use both, and we do. Um, and Ken, uh, one on um, performance bonuses. This, this is from a shareholder who asks, why are there performance bonuses put in place when employees are employed to do a job for a commercial wage? Look, again, it's about uh, being competitive, attracting, retaining, and, and, and motivating um, uh, the talent in the organization. And I think what's really important here is that remuneration outcomes that are related to performance programs are linked to the shareholder experience as well. So if the company is doing well and shareholders are getting rewarded, then management should be rewarded, and the reverse should also be the case. And I think if you look at our track record over, I'm going to say, the last eight or ten years, it would, it would reflect a very close linkage between the shareholder experience and the outcome in performance bonuses for management. So you know, this year we had a 100% you know, long-term incentive program vesting, but look at the performance of the company. Uh, you know, it's been very strong. And same for the previous year, we had 100% vesting of the, of the long-term incentive program, but we had a very strong year as well. The previous year, I think it was 48%, so maybe half of the performance. But for the previous five years, there was no vesting of long-term incentive programs, zero. And that's because the, the, the company's performance um, was, was below that of its peers for a number of reasons. And, and you know, I think everybody was aware of what happened with uh, the oil and gas investment that was made in shale. So you know, I, I think if you look over the last eight years, the outcome from long-term incentive programs has been very much aligned with the shareholder experience. And we're, um, as a board, very aware that that needs to continue. And we have the tools at our disposal in order to do a holistic review and to modify remuneration outcomes if we don't think that they're aligned with the shareholder experience. Um, Ken, we have a question here from Shirley on the influence of ESG and super, superannuation funds on how we operate. She asks, has, has BHP's board looked at how to mitigate the superannuation funds influence on the BHP's board by forcing a green agenda take up of policies on the BHP's daily business. Uh, she says, she makes a comment by, and says, refer to articles in the business pages of the newspapers and superannuation companies' own policies. She says, this has a detri detrimental effect on, BH on the profits of BHP with little or no value to m most of the ordinary shareholders who don't share these beliefs. Right, so look, ESG 
environmental social governance is, is a broad area. And so we're, as a board, we focus on those areas that have direct alignment to our business case. And maybe I'll, I'll point out a couple. Diversity. Um, we have a gender balance target by 2025 uh, objective. And uh, it's the right thing to do, but more importantly, there's a strong business case around that because our data shows that our, our most diverse uh, teams are also our most productive and safe teams. So there's a business case around that as well. If you look at our um, objectives around emission reduction and, and, and what we can do to help mitigate climate change. And uh, Cheryl will be aware that last year we put to them a climate transition action plan for them to vote on and we had very strong support around that. Well, if you look at, and we think decarbonization is a, is a, is a mega trend. Um, and, and the great news here is that the more the world decarbonizes, the more valuable BHP becomes. Well, why is that? Well, to decarbonize, we're going to need more wind turbines, we're going to need more solar, uh, there's going to be more infrastructure required. All of that needs copper, it needs nickel, it needs steel. And so um, we're essential to the decarbonization of the world, and it's going to be um, the more the world decarbonizes, the more valuable we'll become as a company. So those things are, 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 are very much aligned, that our, our strategy is aligned with our climate transition action plan goals. And it's important that we continue you know, uh, to look at our social value pillars, that we continue to execute against those well, because that will continue to allow us access to capital uh, and, and, and to markets in an advantaged way going forward. So very much aligned to our, our business case. Ken, can I just now move to uh, a question on the environment? Um, Helen asks, what is BHP doing to protect the environment and fragile ecosystems? Right, so as I mentioned earlier, we've introduced a new social value framework and, and scorecard. And environment is one of the six important pillars of that, of that framework, first and foremost. Um, BHP has about six million hectares that, that it either owns or manages or, or, or leases. But we only use about 2% of that uh, for our mining activities. So, so we think that there's a real opportunity here for us to use um, you know, that resource for nature positive outcomes. And so in our scorecard, uh, we actually have a goal of having 30% of that land um, under um, conservation or restoration or regenerative uh, activities uh, going forward. So that's, so that's actually in the scorecard. Ken, um, Helen has also asked about the protection of cultural heritage. Um, could you um, address that part of her question? Yeah, no, that's an incredibly important uh, part of um, our engagement with, with traditional owners. I mean, I, the reality is that um, we don't always own the land in which we uh, in which we operate, and and so we're in partnership with our traditional owners. In in, in the Pilbara, for example, we've got a hundred years of iron ore in the ground, and so we are in a relationship with our traditional owners for the next hundred years. And and so it's really important that we have mutual respect and understanding in in those um, in those relationships. And so obviously we're going to follow all the regulatory requirements around the protection of. In, uh, indigenous heritage, but we want to go beyond that. And, and a good example is, um, you know, in the Pilbara, in our new south flank operation, you know, we've set up sort of a real-time heritage council with the Banjama, our traditional owners there, so that as we uh, come across uh, indigenous heritage, we can work hand in glove together in real time to develop solutions uh, for the protection of that uh, cultural heritage going forward. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move tact completely now. Um, a shareholder has asked a question about COVID vaccination. Sean has said, at what stage will BHP remove COVID vaccination policy for Australian workers who should have the right to choose and privacy of their own medical information? Look, again, good question. Safety is always going to be you know, first and foremost in our minds. And so the decisions that we 
uh, have taken around COVID vaccination haven't been taken lightly, but they've been taken with the best advice that, that we have, both externally and, and from our own teams, around what we need to do to keep our coworkers safe. And uh, that is having a fully vaccinated workforce. Will that be the case forever? I hope not. You know, I, as we work our way through the pandemic and get to the other side of that, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll move back to where we were pre the pandemic. But, but for now, um, we're not there. And so we'll continue to have these uh, requirements in place uh, unapologetically for the protection uh, of, our, of our workforce because nothing's more important to us than safety. Um, Ken, can I um, move uh, uh, to another completely different topic on company donations? Um, this is a question from a shareholder called Kim who asks, what donations and to who does BHP make to state or territory premiers and Lord Mayors and in what form do these donations take, for example, cash or gifts? And who is the person responsible or for approving these donations? Right, so first and foremost, it's very clear in, in BHP's code of conduct, we don't make political donations full stop. So, um, uh, hope, you know, hopefully that's, that's quite frankly self-explanatory. But we do make social value contributions to the communities in which we operate. As a matter of fact, we have a, a, a commitment of 1% of net profit that, that we put back uh, into the communities through you know, social value contributions. And there's a process that, that, that's followed um, for the authorization and approval of those uh, of those donations, but they're but they are they're charitable donations as opposed to political donations because, as I said, political donations um, aren't allowed within our code of conduct. I understand. Um, and can we have a couple of questions on on, on our people and how, and how they're working? The first is um, uh, from Helen, who says. What is BHP doing to ensure diversity of employees at all levels of the company? And, and, and a second from Michelle who wants to know when will BHP embrace flexible working arrangements? Right. So um, first question around diversity. Um, so in 2016, uh, BHP established an aspirational target of having uh, gender balance within the organization by, by 2025. And we're making good progress around that. Back in 2016, I believe uh, female participation in the workforce at BHP was about 17%. Today we're 32, 33%. So we've really made good progress. And uh, you know we define, as others do, gender balance as being at least 40% male, at least 40% female. And so, uh, you know, we think we're on track to, to, de to deliver against that very aspirational target that was sent back in 2016 around gender balance by, by 2025. Um, in terms of the second question? The second question was from Michelle, who was um, interested in when BHP will embrace flexible work around. Look, I think we've embraced it. Um, and, you know, that was thoroughly tested <laughs> through COVID when we had uh, you know, coworkers working from home, it works. Um, and so um, I guess maybe that might be one of the positives that came out of COVID was that you know, everybody was able to, to, to develop and refine their systems around flexible, uh, flexible working. So um, yeah, no, we're very supportive of flexible work practices. Thank you. Um, that may be all we've got time for, I think, Ken. Um, is, and, and thank you very much for, for for coming along and, and for taking the time to, to address these questions from shareholders. I think um, you would agree that um, shareholders are very interested and very thoughtful uh, about um, how we're doing and, and interested. So really do appreciate that, um, that you've taken the time to, to come along and, and speak with them. Well, look, it's been my pleasure and, and uh, a terrific set of questions from our shareholders. No surprise there. And, Again, um, I'd like to thank them for tuning in. Uh, hopefully they'll get some value out of this, out of this 30 minutes. And um, they can also tune in to the webcast um, at the AGM in Perth as well.